First story. Stepsister stole my car and crashed it into a wall, then reused it to pay for the damages. I threatened to call the cops, and stepdad said I should let it go, as her police uncle wouldn't help her this time. Then he lied about me crashing my car. So, I got her arrested and went in see. Now, stepdad broke into my house, demanding I invite them to my wedding, or else he won't let the wedding happen. My stepsister F21 crashed my F18 new car, after I told her she couldn't use it again. My stepsister, Paula, had two cars that she got from her dad and my mom, and she destroyed both of them within months after she got them. My mom and her dad got married when I was 11, after my dad died three years prior. I had a hard time accepting her dad and her, but in the end I got used to it, and we have a solid relationship, at least with her dad and me. Paula got her first car when she was 17. Just after she got her license, it was an older Audi she got from her dad. It wasn't the nicest car, but it was a good start. She didn't like the car, but it was better than nothing, so she used it. But after four months, she crashed it into my mom's car as she was coming back from a party. The second car she had, she got last year for Christmas. My mom and her dad bought it for her, but guess what? She drove it into the river on New Year's Day because she forgot to put the handbrake on. My mom and her dad were furious, but she didn't care. She said she would just buy a new car and they should chill out. She moved out afterwards to her own apartment. So I just bought myself my dream car, a 2014 Mini Cooper. I spent years saving for it. My stepsister visited two weeks ago over the weekend while I was at my grandparents' house, so she thought she could use my car while I was gone and drive shopping with it. As I got home, I saw a huge scratch on the back. I asked my mom how it got there. She was clueless. She didn't know Paula took the car while they were sleeping. Paula, looking all innocent, said she took the car on a little shopping tour because I wasn't using it. I was so angry at her and said if she ever used my car again without my permission, I would kick her arse to the moon and back. She said she was sorry, and that some idiot was it, not her. When I was coming home today, I saw my car crash into the wall in front of our house and Paula, my mom, and her dad standing beside it. I was furious. I asked what happened, and my car was in the wall. Paula said she accidentally crashed it because she wanted to drive to the nail salon, and she confused the front and reverse gears. I exploded. I screamed at her that I wanted her to pay for the car, and that she was a horrible person because she didn't even look guilty for destroying my car, and she should never drive a car again in her life because all she does is cause accidents. I stormed away and looked into my room. Her dad said I should forgive her and that it was an accident, but we were sisters. I was shocked and so disappointed in my mom because she said nothing against it. I said that she wasn't my sister, that I would never forgive her, that I would move to my grandparents and that she should better pay for my car, or I would sue her. He said that I was a brat talking to them like that, and that not forgiving her would make me a bad human being. So am I the arsy hole for not forgiving her? Verdict. Not the arsy hole. Relevant comments. View Entrepreneur 383. NTA. She stole your car for a second time and wrecked it. I'd report her to the police for theft. Then file a claim on the insurance, letting them know the damage was done during the theft. But in all seriousness, why the hell did she have access to the keys in the first place? OP. I'm going to the police tomorrow, and hopefully all goes well. She got the keys to my room. I have a key holder there, so she just grabbed them while I was gone. Dubs and 49ers. Does she even have a license? Insurance? OP. She got her license after her third try, and almost got it withdrawn for speeding. But my uncle works at the police station, so she always gets out of trouble. Sage Green 98. NTA. She stole your car, drove it, and then wrecked it. She did not have your permission to use it. Therefore, it was stolen. Personally, I'd report her to the police and press charges. If that doesn't get her attention, then I am afraid nothing will. The facts are clear. No permission to use it plus person uses it anyway equal sign theft of car. Update 1. Next day. Trying to do this update again hopefully. This will go out. Today morning. I got a call from my stepdad saying Paul came crying and drunk driving in a car to them and begged him to try to change my mind to the police because she doesn't want to get into trouble. He said if I go to the police, my uncle won't do anything for me and that I'm no longer welcome at home. I just got back from the police station and filled out a report of theft and damage to property again. Paula turned out and her dad called the police and said that I would frame her and that I crashed the car into the wall. So I'm on the way to a lawyer to help me with all of that. I also called my insurance company, and they said that would work for getting me the money I deserve. 
I'm now living at my grandparents' house and will distance myself from the rest for a while. Some of you had some questions about stuff. So I don't know why my mom didn't say anything against Paula and her dad. She's normally very vocal about her bad driving skills. Paula got both cars bought for her because she doesn't have the money to buy one herself. But I had, so they only bought her the cars. When she crashed into my mom's car, she damaged only the right side of the car. So my mom wasn't that pissed at her. Paula always got out of trouble because my uncle always got her out of it. She got her license after the third try. And only after my mom helped her out did she get into an accident when she drove my mom's car and went to the hospital for a broken leg. But nothing really happened to the car. I will update when something happens. And thank you for all the support in the comments. It helped a lot. Small update. I just found out that my stepsister tried to fight my mom after she contacted me and wanted me to come back home. She's in the hospital right now because Paula broke her nose. I'm now on my way to her and I hope she's alright and sees what kind of person she really is. Again, a new update. Paula got arrested for stealing the car from a neighbor, and my stepdad is not talking to my mom or me right now, and my mom is thinking about getting a divorce. I don't really know what to say. I'm just overwhelmed with the situation right now, so yeah. Update. Eight months later. So, hey, I know it's been a while since I posted, and a lot has happened. Let's just say that my stepsister was in prison for a while, because of what happened. I did go through with it, and it was so satisfying seeing it happen. She actually got two years, but was released two weeks ago for good behavior or something. But I think my uncle had something to do with it. I did get my money, but my car was a total mess, ripped to pieces by my baby. Anyway, I'm now driving a beautiful Audi RS5 coupe, and nobody else will ever drive it. My mom did try to get a divorce from my stepdad, but she didn't go through with it. I don't know why, but after that, we went without contact for five months. We are slowly moving forward because my grandparents died three months ago, and I just needed them. On a better note, I'm engaged to my amazing fiancé. She's been helping me through all this, and we decided after three years of dating to go to the next level. Now the reason I'm writing all of this is that we're planning to get married in May at a botanical garden where we had our first date, and I told my mom about it while I was over at her house. She was really happy for me, but then my stepdad walked in, and I left because we're not on speaking terms. Two days later, my mom called me and said that I should invite my stepdad and stepsister to the wedding because she learned her lesson and that we can now move past this. I was angry and maybe said some things I shouldn't have said, but my anger got the best of me. I talked to my fiancé about it, and she said I should apologize to my mom for what I said, but that my stepsister will definitely not come to the wedding. This morning, we were rudely awakened by my stepdad in my living room. He was screaming and said we should never be allowed to get married and that even if we did, they should be able to come. I kicked him out, and after the initial shock because I had no idea how he even got in, yeah, that is what is happening, so I hope you like the update. Sorry that I didn't post it to Ada. I don't know why, but it doesn't allow me to post there. Comments. No underscore language underscore 423. Are you going to call the police on stepdad? I think you are in more danger than you think. This man is on the path to committing violence against you. Second story. Entitled parents won't attend her daughter's HS graduation and refuse to let her attend, saying they will celebrate in their church, knowing she got bullied there and has so many bad memories. They then threatened to stop paying for her college and kick her out of the house, so the daughter decided to go and see with them herself. Parents changed their mind on attending my high school graduation after our church announced their own in two weeks, and they said they'd charge me rent starting in July if I attended the high school graduation instead of our churches. So I'm writing this because my college plans were uprooted as of Sunday, June 16th. I'll be graduating this week, and my ceremony is later this week. However, my church announced that they'll be doing their own graduation ceremony on July 7th, where they'll have church graduates walk down the aisle of the sanctuary during service to be recognized and receive prayer. And the pastor announced it on the 16th. According to my parents, he said it was important to make sure the next generation rooted their future in God and the church will be having a BBQ after service in honor of the graduates. However, I haven't attended church since I was 16 due to an incident, I'll explain later. But my parents seem hell-bent on making sure I attend, not just the church graduation but church from now on too. And they added strings to prior agreements that were never attached. Before the church graduation was announced, my parents agreed to split tuition with me to attend a community college upon my finding a job this summer I planned to transfer afterward to finish my bachelor's. However, after the announcement, 
My parents said they weren't going to attend my graduation and that I wasn't allowed to either a complete 180 out of nowhere. We even invited relatives to attend from out of state, but my parents already told them to attend the church graduation instead, and I feel like they pulled the rug from under me. When I said I still plan to attend my high school graduation with friends, they threatened to rescind their offer to pay for college if I went and didn't come to the church one, and I just feel blindsided by this. When I tried to explain how they changed their minds out of nowhere, they said that the pastor talked about how people lost their way in college by disregarding faith and morals, so they weren't going to pay for me to go and change because of worldly influences. But when I said that I would pay for tuition myself without them if I find a job while still attending the high school graduation, they said they'd charge me rent starting in July, which is unfair because I'm yet to find a job. I've been applying like crazy the past few weeks, and I have a few interviews lined up too. They're just trying to make me return to church after I stopped attending two years ago and I've been really frustrated with their flip-flop. They said they're doing this because they made mistakes in college before later finding God, and they didn't want me to make the same ones. The last thing I'll add is this. I was bullied in that church in the past, and I reached my breaking point two years ago. The youth had a camp out on the grass behind the church, where I was hazed by this really annoying girl, and no one did anything including the assistant chaperone in our tent. There were stupid pranks that were made in good fun. But the most hurtful thing was when that one girl made jokes or comments about my body or weight when we were changing, which really hurt. And our tent chaperone didn't do anything when I told her afterward because she wasn't in there as we changed. This is just one of many things with this girl during youth group when leaders weren't looking. But that was the most hurtful. However, to my surprise, my parents took my side and didn't make me attend youth group after that. And they let me stop attending for the most part, much to my surprise. I miss how they were reasonable in the past and hope that they can be reasonable again with me here. Most of my relatives are also churchgoers, and have agreed to attend the church graduation instead. And I just need advice because it all happened so fast. And it especially hurts that they don't want to attend my high school graduation. My friends are in high school, and I don't consider anyone in our church's youth group to be my friend. So of course I want to graduate with my friends, but I can't pay rent in July as they're threatening because it's just a few days away. And I need advice on how to get through to them. Update. My parents moved the goalpost and threatened to put my things outside on the night of my high school graduation, if I attended after venting to a relative. So I decided not to attend to preserve my mental health. I was unable to update sooner due to my phone being taken away. But I'll explain why. A few people suggested reaching out to some non-religious relatives to see if they could help or even provide shelter if they tried to throw me out. And I decided on my aunt after having no success with friends. I told some friends first about everything my parents threatened. But long story short, they talked to their parents, who were unable to take me in, and they said it was last minute or mostly busy with their own things or graduations too. I then tried my aunt and told her everything too, and she said I could stay with her soon, but not in time for my high school graduation because it was really short notice. She said I could at some point this summer, and she wasn't initially coming to my graduation because she lives on the other side of the country but she said she would try to talk some sense into my parents, and that led to my phone being removed. My parents didn't like that I told her because it was none of her business, according to them. I don't know what was said on the call, and they threatened to turn off my phone plan unless I gave them my phone, and I caved when they were yelling at me and gave it to them along with my laptop. They wanted to because they threatened to kick me out sooner than July for talking about them to my aunt, because she could tell others. They also said that they'd put my stuff outside while I was at the high school graduation if I attended. So they would kick me out that night, instead of their original threat, to start charging me rent in July. So for those reasons plus another, I'll say in a moment. I decided not to attend my high school graduation, because I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. I was already having anxiety about what they'd do to my stuff while there, and I didn't want to be homeless when I returned. I also had a loss of motivation to do other things leading up to it, like sports, hanging out, or even watching TV. I knew I wouldn't enjoy it because I was already dreading it before it happened, and my anxiety there would be worse than the lead-up. I also didn't want to wear a smile the whole time with none of my family in attendance either, and I didn't think I could hide it emotionally either. I also decided to attend the church graduation to get it over with, and I rationalized it like I did with other things growing up. I was forced to go to youth groups and kid choirs growing up, and I was forced to be baptized too. This was no different. It was just five minutes of the pastor calling all graduates on stage to pray for them. And they didn't even give us a gift like on Mother's Day. All my life, I've had to suck up things I hated at church. 
and the church graduation was less tedious than the pre-baptism classes. They were mandatory, because it was only five minutes on stage compared to three weeks of baptism classes. Some relatives came, gave me money from carts, and we ate lunch at a restaurant afterward, something we did when my dad was elected to a church position years ago, and invited friends to see him get installed before lunch afterward. I'm pretty used to the song and dance, and this was easier or shorter than other church BS. My parents also returned my phone after the church graduation, and a lot of my anxiety lessened when I decided to skip my graduation. Don't get me wrong, I'll always hate them for it, and I'm no longer accepting their help for college either. I'm going to find a job, hopefully too if part-time, and try to move out over the summer if I can, and I won't talk to them again afterward. Because of their stress, I decided to skip a once-in-a-lifetime event to prioritize my mental health, because I wouldn't have enjoyed it anyway with the stress. And the fact that they're happy with me for obeying, as they gave my phone back, should allow me to find jobs without additional stress. They also withdrew their July rent threat, and everything's been peaceful since the church graduation, although I'll never forgive them for what they tried to do. I also expect them to threaten me with something else in the future too, so I hope to move out as soon as possible, even if it means staying with my aunt until finding a job. I'm glad she said I could stay with her, and hopefully the time until I do remains peaceful. Third story. Boyfriend sawed his girlfriend on her birthday, then tried to blame her by gaslighting her. So she broke up with him via text and blocked his sorry arse, as he wasn't worth her time. It was my birthday yesterday, and he told me we should have birthdays axed. It had been a long day. I'd driven for four hours and was completely exhausted after spending the weekend visiting some friends. He said he had to, but I kept saying no. I told him it would hurt if I wasn't turned on enough. I didn't want to. It wasn't enough to stop him. He heard me crying out in pain and valued his own orgasm over anything else. He didn't listen to me. He didn't care. I've never felt more used in my life. I feel so disgusting and nasty. I thought he was different and that maybe things would work out well. I'm so heartbroken. I feel like my world is collapsing in on itself. I don't know what I want from sharing this. I just can't tell anyone Earl and need to get it off my chest. Edit. Thank you everyone for your supportive words. I wish I could reply to you all but I really wasn't expecting this much attention, and it's incredibly overwhelming. I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do. We're in a long-distance relationship, and I'm not going to see him for a few weeks, so it gives me a chance to think about it and weigh up my options. I'm considering seeking professional help, but resources in my area are incredibly limited, so we shall have to see. Update. I debated writing an update for a while, but a lot of the advice I got was really helpful, so I figured I could at least update to let you know where things are. This may be a long post. Sorry about that. So, my last post was just less than six weeks ago. And a lot has changed since then. I stayed with my now ex. Don't worry boyfriend until last week due to a shared financial commitment that went kind of completely wrong in every way possible. Since before we even started dating, we had both been saving separately for our dream holiday, which coincidentally ended up being the exact same holiday. A tour of some countries we'd both always wanted to visit on a completely new continent. We had sunk thousands into this holiday, enough that I couldn't just walk away from a commitment like that. It was booked for about two weeks after he assaulted me. I was so lost and unsure of what to do. I'd been looking forward to this for months. Every penny from my minimum wage job had gone towards this, and suddenly the person I was supposed to be going with, the one supposed to be my best friend, partner, and even soulmate, had ruined it. For my own sake, I couldn't walk away. And for my own safety, I felt I couldn't break up with him and still go. I chose the holiday. I do not regret my choice. Despite everything I am about to say, I still had a brilliant time. Unfortunately, I ended up getting really ill about a week before, and it ended up getting progressively worse until I ended up needing to see a doctor while on holiday. I was diagnosed not willing to share what with you for privacy reasons, sorry and underwent some treatment, but I may never fully recover. I was weak and lost a lot of weight, I couldn't really afford to lose, I'm now severely underweight. My cardiovascular health is shot. I spent most of this holiday barely able to walk more than 100 meters without needing a break. And I am still recovering from the effects now. Now is where that becomes relevant. I knew going into this holiday that SX would be a big part of what my partner would be expecting. While I was ill, I had absolutely no SX drive and was way too ill to even consider it. My ex, despite knowing this and being privy to details of my illness, I haven't shared here still insisted on throwing a tantrum about it every day. He did not force himself on me. Instead, 
I was guilted and shamed for not wanting to have sex, made to feel like a bad girlfriend because I wasn't willing to let him get off. A direct quote is, imagine looking forward to having something three times a day, and you don't even get it once a week. Like, am I a thing to have? I know my worth, and it's more than his sorry arse could ever imagine. It's laughable almost now, in hindsight. He also, at the end of the first week, started a big conversation with me about where our relationship was going to go. He made up a bunch of lies, I know them to be lies, because he actually admitted it to me later on, telling me how he'd thought of breaking up with me, how we'd been in a rough spot for a few months, and how he was starting to resent me. He said how much less attractive I was now that I'd lost weight again. Not my fault, it was the illness, which actually really hurt. The whole conversation was hilarious to my feverish arse, because, yeah, we had those problems. But he wasn't supposed to know. I just remember putting on a big show of crying, and saying how ill I felt, and how I'd tried to be a good girlfriend. But it was so hard to think when I felt so gross. It was half true, half an excuse to just let out some of my rage and guilt him back. It worked. He ended up backing down and apologizing. This is where things get weird. After that first week, I actually started to feel better. Not normal by any means, but definitely better than before. It was like my ex completely shifted. He actually told me that he didn't think I'd been that ill until I started to feel better. And he could tell the difference. Let me repeat that. He thought I was a fake. Being sick. He thought I'd faked it all just because I didn't want to be dating him anymore. At this point, I was so fatigued that I didn't even know what to say. So things progressed. We settled whatever had been happening before. And as I started to feel better, we started hanging out a lot more like we used to before everything happened. This hurt more than anything else, I think. It was a reminder that, despite him assaulting me, he was still my best friend at one point. The person who knew me better than anyone. And then he switched more to a weird kind of almost mental abuse. I don't even know. So I'm just going to list things that he kept doing. And you can make your own judgment. Kept being incredibly condescending and acting like I was really stupid. Examples include, if I found directions to somewhere we were going, he'd always have to double-check himself just in case I was wrong I never was. Also, if I made a mistake that is, one night I went to pour some leftover drink down the sink, without realizing the hotel housekeeping had left the plug in so it didn't drain, I was made to feel so stupid for it. Despite it being an innocent mistake, he would also use this incredibly condescending tone, talking to me like I'm five years old. I repeatedly told him off for this, and even used the same tone back to him several times where he would snap at me. He kept calling my body ugly, saying he couldn't wait for me to gain the weight I lost back so he could be attracted to me again. I've always struggled with my weight and eating. I battled anorexia for years and recently got over a pretty bad relapse, and having lost this weight and hearing so much about it has really badly affected me. I told him this, and all he would say was something along the lines of how he was just being honest. For any activity I wanted to do that he didn't, I was made to feel so awful. We had both agreed prior to the trip that we would have to compromise on activities we did. But any time I wanted to do something he didn't, he would always act all angry and standoffish towards me. Acting like I was being so horrible to him for dragging him somewhere he didn't want to be. Repeatedly denied me access to food or drink when I was too weak to get it myself. With the lack of appetite and weight loss and the heat of the countries we were in, I often got lightheaded and he would simply try and make me power through it rather than let me get something to eat or drink, even if we were passing a food stall or shop. I am genuinely lucky I didn't faint because I don't know what he would have done. The list goes on. But this post is already long enough, so I'll stop there. It was so incredibly weird, like 70% of the time I would get the guy I fell in love with. My best friend. The other 30% was this miserable bastard who must hate me. We arrived home a week ago. We separated, and the second I got off the train, despite being exhausted after a 20-plus hour journey, I drove four hours up to my best friend's house and told him everything. I was scared before, but the behavior this trip showed really cemented that I needed help dealing with everything. I was so scared to trust him, but I'm glad I did. He held me while I cried and made us both dinner, and then we watched Criminal Minds while brainstorming a plan. His housemate, another close friend of mine, joined us at one point, and they helped me come up with a plan to break up with him. And I did. Over text. Which felt incredibly cold. But he didn't deserve more of an explanation. I told him everything that had happened. Including what he did to me before the rope. I have never felt more sick sending a message. But I did it. I am free. It stinks that things happened the way they did. I had such high expectations for this holiday.
and the reality was a little humbling. I still had a brilliant time, though. It truly was amazing, and I have decided I will be going back in the future with better company. Thank you to anyone who has read this far. I don't know how much is relevant. I just figured you guys talked some sense into me before, so you deserve to know the full story of what happened. Anyway, now I'm going to go back to sleep and focus on recovering before I start work again. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.